William, he was raised in the city. Uh, I used to call them children. I don't call them that anymore. These are young people there. And I am really impressed with what the Grace have done. Billy has lived to be home every day. <laughs> 14. And that is a miracle before God. And I'm thankful to see that. And, uh, and you, you, to know Billy is to love him. And to, uh, he, uh, he has been a wonderful uh, opportunity of illustration. <laughs> you know, one person asked, you know, you know why preachers have children, don't you? They're a source of illustration. So that's why you have children. And uh, he is two or three volumes and he's on the light. Thank you for it. How long we go, preacher? It's a quarter to about four minutes. Okay. Let's turn, if you would, with the first Thessalonians. And uh, we can't uh, help folks if they're not here, so we'll invite you to do all you can to get to come. And uh, I'll do my best once I get here get their attention. They'll, if they come here to preach, I guarantee you, they'll not go out the same. They'll either be glad, mad, or sad. But they will uh, go out of here knowing that they preached it. Amen. So don't you uh, want everybody to be glad? Well, I don't want to have to. The Bible says it's enough to serve and be as his master. That's what, that's what uh, Matthew wrote. He said it's enough to be as his master. There's folks hated him. The other thing. Right. There's folks that made fun of him. There are folks that didn't. And he said that only one ground out of the four that you plant good seed would ever produce anything. So uh, I feel like I ought to be, you know, I'm not going to try to get everybody like me. Jesus couldn't do it. Amen? It's, it's, right. Right. it's me trying to do that. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians and let's read that first chapter. Uh, very familiar. I'm going to teach this a little bit on why have a good church? What is a good church? Let's talk about the church this morning in Sunday school. And I choose First Thessalonians. For years, I have told folks that just got saved, young Christians, to read the book of John. And I always use that as a, because there's so much in there about salvation and about the gospel. And a, a, a great preacher one time I heard say that he recommended First Thessalonians. Man, kind of bothered me. You know? but, well, but it's the first book Paul wrote. First in chronological order. Then it says over the book of Acts in Acts 17 that when he was here, he preached and talked to them uh, three Sabbath days in the, in the synagogue. I often believe that, that was just three days, three, that was only, he was just there three weeks. That's not what that says. It says he taught in the synagogue for three Sabbaths. After three Sabbaths, they kicked him out. You know the problem he had. He went on down to Berea from here, and then uh, some of those rabble rousers from Thessalonica came on down to Berea and caused him all kinds of trouble. So it's a good possibility he was there much longer than just three weeks. He might not have been there much more than a couple of months, but he was there. The statement is that he taught three Sabbaths in the synagogue. If you read that, they did not like it after about the second or third Sabbath. Some of those folks were getting saved, and they pushed him out of the synagogue. And so this is a young church, and it is a church founded upon the Pauline pre uh, uh, preaching. But in the, in the epistle, as I say, the older man that I referred to recommending this, there's so much here about church doctrine, about soul winning, about being godly, that, and it's condensed into these uh, these five chapters. It's an important, important little book, and I would recommend that you read it on a regular basis to understand the workings of the New Testament church. And then, of course, you know that every chapter has a specific reference to the second coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, anytime you read something that gets you looking for Jesus to come, it's good for you. So I recommend it to you. Let's read this first chapter, and then we'll give you some thoughts on this book and on the church. Paul and Silvanius and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God, in the Father, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be on you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you have, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. A real strong emphasis on the relationship of the word. You notice twice he said talk about the word here. Go over to chapter 2 
And uh, he says uh, in verse 13, For this cause also thank we our God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as the truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. Real emphasis in this Bible, in this book, on the emphasis of the Bible, the life of these believers. And uh, verse 7, back in chapter uh, 1, so that ye were in samples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of every man we had among, uh, unto you, and how ye trusted in God, or how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait on his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, I have a little time of trouble getting my eyes focused. I do not need bifocals. I will not wear bifocals until I get to be 50. My doctor tried to put bifocals on me last year. And I said, no, I'm not wearing white bifocals. And I don't care if I have to nail the Bible up on the back wall and read it. Hey, man, I'm not going to wear bifocals. So you, while I get my head adjusted and get my eyes have patience with me. This book, the first Thessalonians, I said, deals with, and it's, it's a church epistle. I'm a local church evangelist, a church revivalist, and uh, I believe one of, the, one, of the, one of the areas that we really are failing in a lot of our churches is, is the understanding of the function of the church. And to be perfectly honest with you, that we have so become Presbyterianized because of the writers, the Presbyterian writers in our churches have become the only interest they have is evangelism. In other words, get the person saved, and then whether they have any true church doctrine after that or any true church practice is immaterial. If that was the case, we would not have all these church epistles. There would not be all this instruction on church life. Really, your message that you give, this church here or any church, is based on the church life that backs that message. And that's why we're failing in many, many places. That's now, why evangelism are being saved has become an end in itself. And really, salvation is the beginning. And uh, I say this, I may say it again this week in another message, but salvation and experience, the time that you got saved, is the highest point in your physical life. It is the greatest thing physically. You say, oh, I thought it was spiritual. If it was only spiritual with you, then you didn't get what I got. In 1965, when I got saved, my whole physical life changed, as well as my spiritual life. My outward life, what I live, how, what I did physically. It's the highest point. Nothing getting married, having children. I don't care what experience you go through. Nothing compares physically to the day you got saved. In your spiritual life, it is the lowest point in your Christian experience. The day you got saved is the bottom, the lowest point. You say, well, preacher, I thought it was the lowest. That's where we got in. He said, desire, uh, I just said, as newborn babes, what? Desire to consume them for the word that you love. They grow. Anybody here want to go back to the train? Anybody here want to go back to those days when you're crawling around with bugs on the floor and all that business? We grow up. We go on. And really, in your spiritual life, you should look back to salvation as the greatest day of your life. It is the lowest point. That was the time you was the most ignorant about the things of God. The time that you had less knowledge of the Word of God. You, you had no fellowship with God. You didn't know what it was to worship God. And so... Uh, what we've done, fundamentalism, and I use that term very generically, I hope you understand that it covers a broad spectrum of people, but I have noticed what's happened is this, everything is salvation oriented, looking back to the day we got saved, building around, and we wonder why we have any weak, childlike Christians. We can't get out of the nursery, and thus, we have the nursery back in the church. So my emphasis is trying to help us to see what I think what Paul wants us to see, and that is where to go on. He talks to this church, and the uh, first thing I want to say about a good church or a church, and these are just some introductory notes. I'll say some things about Well, let me say these things about Thessalonica and Mike and get them out of the way. Uh, as I said, it's the letter written by Paul. In chapter 1, if you wanted an outline or some outline, some way to study it, in chapter 1, you have the walk of faith. Here's the model church. Then in chapter 2, you have the labor of love. Remember, he said, I remember your walk and the labor of love and all that other. Chapter 2, here's the labor of love. Here's the model servant chapter 2. In chapter 3 there's the life of holiness. Here you see moral discipline. Man, we need moral discipline. That's not in chapter 3. Chapter 4, there's the hope of patience. 
deals with the model of faith. Not only, I think Schofield in his in his notes, I want to make sure I'm not, yes, he calls it the model church, and he calls it the, the model brother and so forth. This idea of being a pattern, a model. In chapter 4, here's that hope of patience, and he has this model of faith. And you remember he says, remember chapter 4 is the chapter that has, I have not able to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow for not as others, and have no hope for not to say it. How the Lord's going to come again. And that wonderful passage, what's it for? Give us our faith, our model of faith. And in chapter 5, seeking light. And then you have this model walk, how to walk with God. Uh, they were noted, these Thessalonican people were noted for their faith, they're noted for their love that labored, their hope that was patient, and their walk that was pure. And uh, over the walls of Thessalonica, a great, uh, large, one of their uh, one of their municipal buildings when they dug up the old town, the old, the old area of Thessalonica. And across the archway going into one of these large buildings was these words were engraved in the stone during the time Paul must have walked right under this. He probably was right in this same area, probably preached under it a number of times. And this is what's what they found engraved that after death, no reviving, after the grave, no meeting again. Don't you know that Paul enjoyed preaching under that? That was the heathen's life. After the death, no reviving. After the grave, no meeting again. And what did he say? I had you not to sorrow, brothers and others, which have no hope. He talked about the resurrection. He talked, talked to them about the second coming. And so every chapter, as I said, is filled with something about the second coming. It's personal. He talks about it. chapter 2 as being historical. He talks in chapter 3 about it being an emotional truth. Chapter 4, doctrinal truth, the individual purity. Then in chapter 5, he talks about it as a practical truth, bringing eternal harmony. There was some problems. Some call it the perfect church. The Thessalonian people were afflicted. These people were suffering. They had persecution. They were being molested and oppressed. But over and over again, chapter 1, verse 6, chapter 2, verse 20, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, chapter 5, verse 16, the words joy and rejoicing, joy and rejoicing. I do not believe a protected church is a joyful church. A church Amen. is under persecution, a church is being suffering, being molested, being, you say, well, preacher, that doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. It is not, but that is really what produces joy. Because that kind of church has to pull together with a whole lot of benefits when everything's going rosy, cries about sin in the church. So they, they had a lot of joy. But they were not perfect in that. I mean, there was some disobedience. According to chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, they were being disobedient and not honoring the spiritual leaders. They were not they were not doing it. But let's just, I know all my time will go quickly. And it, I knew it was crazy to try to get one whole book in a Sunday school hour. But we'll, if you don't mind, I'll hit the high spots. And if I, I feel good about something, I'll stop. Okay, we'll try to get as much news as we can. But notice in chapter 5, verse 12. At this situation, he says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. You know, in this day and age in which we live, nobody believes anybody's over them. Amen. So they have two areas of real difficulty. I was sharing this with your pastors. That is the area of responsibility and accountability. Yes. We are no longer feel responsible for anything. We're not accountable for our actions. My mother dropped me on my head too many times when I was young. My dad whipped me. I come from a bad home. I was abused by my father, my uncle, my brother. Somebody abused me. Someone took advantage of me. Well, welcome to the real world. Yeah. Everybody's abused. I mean, everybody can stand up and give horror stories about their childhood, for the most part. And if you weren't abused as a child, you definitely been abused as an adult. <laughs> it's just part of life. The, uh, the fairness doctrine is not a biblical doctrine. God's not right. fair. God has never been fair. God's never promoted fairness. But God is just. He's Amen. just. And Amen. He's righteous. So well, how do you know this is all going to work out? All things work together for good. Not at the end. When we get at the judgment seat of Christ for the saved and the white throne for the lost, the justice of God will prevail. And we'll all see it then. Right now we don't see it. We say it's unfair. God's never been fair. I want to tell you right now, God's never been fair. If you're waiting for fairness from God, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to come up a very bitter and miserable person. Because it just isn't fair. That's, that's humanism. That's where we, we like to be fair. You ever watch people with their kids trying to make their kids play fair? That comes out of baseball, football, and that's not fair. 
you know anything about it, don't give me on athletics. It's like hockey. It's not even fair. They'll let a they'll let a foul go. They'll let a penalty go because it doesn't affect the play. The man will do the same thing ten minutes later and call a penalty. And that's not fair. He was wrong the first time. He should have been penalized, but he's not. Basketball is the same way. It's the reason I have a hard time with sports. Too much is left up to the referee. In football, a guy can slap a guy on the side of the head down the other end of the field and then throw a penalty. Doesn't have anything to do with the game. But he sees it happen. Now there's more fairness in football. But again, they make mistakes too. Are you following what I'm saying? This idea of fairness. He said, what we're having is this people do not want to be held responsible. It's not my fault. Yes, it is. The second thing is accountability. You are responsible to someone else on this earth for your actions. What's hard right now, I don't understand where it's coming from. I don't have all the answers, but I, I see a rebellious spirit that's in our churches. That is, nobody's going to tell me what to do. It's really predominant among women. I think it comes from the ERA, the women's lib, and the influence of humanism. Women have come a long way, baby. They have come. I tell people, I preach in the family. I preach a lot of family conferences. And I tell these dumb-headed men, uh, they treat these women and this idea of keeping them bare, uh, barefoot and pregnant for the rest of their life, it don't work in the 20th century. I tell men, you know, some of these ladies got high school education now. Hey, man, some of them college are at Hey, they go out here tomorrow and get a job and put you in the street if they want to. This is a different world we live in. And what's happened is there's a, there's a mass amount of rebellion that's strong among our women because of the influences. But what we have is this. Nobody, no man is telling me what to do. Hello? No preacher's telling me what to do. Man. I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, the problem with that is that's anti-biblical. And the very one of the things he said, there's disobedience to spiritual leadership. And if you see this prominent, they don't know this is in the Bible. Right here, he said, cover, he says, uh, he says, beseech you, brethren, that word's the same word that's used in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, it's a begging, I beg you. This is something important for you. I beseech you, brethren, you know that which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. He said, you know them, they're among you, and they're over you, and they admonish you. Notice what he says, and you esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. He said, you're to esteem them not because they look good, they talk good, for the work, the work they do, the position they hold. And so they had a problem with that. They had a problem with, uh, with uh, dishonor of lazy and busybodies. In chapter 4, verse 11, they had some people that were dishonest. They're busybodies, and every church has got those. Uh, I'm sure this church, I know you're all real spiritual, but we have busybodies. People can't keep their mouth shut. And they're busy, and everybody else is business. They had it too. Chapter 4, and verse 3, there was the danger of sexual impurity. They had the same problem we had today. He warns them about their vessel. He's not talking about their wife. He's not, listen, that passage, I'm not going into that this morning. He's talking about their own. He said, We have this treasure, Paul said, in what? Earthen vessels. He's talking about the treasure being in our body. I believe the same thing here in chapter 4, verse 3. He said that we're to possess our vessel. He's talking about our physical body. And there's a problem. We live in the day. They had a thing of sexual impurity. And in chapter 4, verse 15, 14, 5, verse 14, there was disorder in their conduct, and he had to straighten that out. In chapter 5, 19 through 21, they were divided uh, over public service and so forth. Yet it was a good church. I mean, they had uh, they had a real testimony for God. They would say it was sounded out everywhere. Their testimony, people got saved. Very little he had to say to them about correction. Now, how would you identify a good church? Let me give you some things to help you. Maybe you can refer to them later, but if you're found here in Thessalonica Church and you're found in any good church, that first thing is biblical order. It must be order. And 1 Corinthians 11, 34 said, I will set it in order. He said, when I come, I will set it in order. He said in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently in what? In order. Talk about public service. Talk about their activity. At Corinth, in 2 Colossians 2, 5, he says, Joy, enjoy, enjoy the holy your order. He said, I have joy seeing the order that you have at Colossians. In Titus 1, 5, or would or should have. Titus 1, 5, he said, For this cause left I decree that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. The emphasis is on having order in the church. And uh, some folks have a misunderstanding of what biblical order is. Everybody wants unity. You'll hear this. The charismatic are pushing this. The, uh, 
the uh, oh, can't think of his name now. Uh, Billy Graham. That mentality is unity. What we want in our we want to maintain the spirit of unity. That is a misquote of the Bible. The Bible says very plainly in Ephesians 4, verse 3, that we are to keep the unity of the Spirit. Yeah. That's the spirit of unity. And there's a definite difference. You have unity, and that unity is wonderful, but that doesn't make it right. It's unity of the Spirit. That is, meaning that everything is in oneness with the Spirit. If you're out of whack with the Spirit of God, you're out of whack with me. And there's not going to be unity. What we're to endeavor to do is not keep the spirit of unity between us. This brother here and this brother over here saying, well, I agree and, and uh, we are in unity so God's in this. No. Does it agree with the spirit of God? Is it united with the spirit? How would you know the difference? Well, the only place you have is the sword, the spirit, the word of God. A lot of times things in the Bible don't match our society. What are we supposed to do? Change the society? No, we stay with the word of God. That's unity with the spirit. And it'll get you out of step many times with the world. In fact, most of the time, uh, they're not in unity with the Spirit. And, uh, and, uh, and as we see the world going today, it's just like uh, I preached here some, a few weeks ago. And uh, I do not call them gays. I do not call them uh, uh, homosexuals. They're sodomites. That's what the Bible calls them sodomites. Yes. You use that term in public service. Even Bible believers get a little antsy. We have been taught not to be bigots by the media. We have been told that if we're anti-Sodomite, somehow or another, we're unkind people. And so society has even blended, uh, bled into our church. And when we talk about God and the Word of God, and we are in unity with Him about Sodomites, we feel a little out of, out of place with the world. Because they would make us think that that's bad. If there's, there's got to be some good Sodomites. They're nice people, and so forth. Friend, that's immaterial. Uh, uh, Joab was a nice fellow, but he needed to be killed. There was, not, there was not a greater man, as a man would speak of, as Joab. But he was a wicked person. Same way with the Sodom. It's not a matter that they make good, I can care less if they make good neighbors, good soldiers, what they make. God says they're an abomination. So what happens to us is this. In an endeavor to keep unity and peace, we go for the unity as opposed to unity with the Spirit. Yes. Biblical order. I had a man tell me one time about, and I was talking to him about the home again. He said, well, my wife and I, we've been married, uh, I don't know how many years at that time, we've never had one fight. The first thing I told him that he was a liar. You cannot live under the same roof with someone of the opposite sex and not have difficulty. <laughs> Hello? Amen. You can't live with it. You just can't do it. It's all people are supposed to live with people. You can't do that. Opposite sex. Opposite ideas. Opposite senses of value. It takes years. My wife and I have been married 31 years. It's taken almost all that time for us to learn how to live in harmony. That would mean we have to knock down drag outs. I'm not talking about that, but there's going to be differences. So I knew he was eight ball to begin with. Anytime you say that you live with a woman and have peace, you're out of your mind. He said, he said, we had we had no problem. I said, well, how is that? Now he now this is his answer now. He said, we've had peace, you know how? He said, whatever she's told me to do, I've done it. And we've never had a fight. Now listen to me. That's unity, that's peace, but that's not biblical. That's right. Just to say that you've not had a fight and everything's fine. He said, whatever she's told me to do, I've done it. That's not biblical. You understand the illustration? Biblical order. You find a good church. The church is biblical. It's based on Bible order. And, you know, the, the problem has always been about officers in the church. Not only biblical order, but biblical officers. There's only a the pastor and the deacon. I listen. Regardless of the California connection, there's only pastors and deacons. There is no such thing as ruling elders, and you be ready to shoot anybody who tells you you need to start self-love, self-ministries, meeting people's homes, and having these little Bible studies on Wednesday nights here in the mid to service. That's not of God. I, every place I listen, I may look like I wrote in the little pumpkins, but I didn't. I've been at this over, I pastored over 21 years, and all the churches that I've ever seen, other than large, large churches, this has either led to a split or a complete destruction of that church. Large churches can lose 150 people and go off and start a new church and never feel it. But you can't have that happen in a church under 200. Have 50 people decide, well, we know more than the pastor does. We're just going to start our own little church. But that happens every time you start this cell ministry. Every time. The office, why no order? Deacons, turn over to Acts 6 with you. Would you for a minute just, just 
Yeah, this is an illustration of what, they're not called deacons here, but this is an illustration of the first deacons. This is where they began. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 lays down some more, uh, more uh, uh, requirements for them. But notice what he says. In those days, when the number of the disciples multiplied, and there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because the widows were neglected in the daily administration. Now here is why they have deacons. Now why did they have these deacons? Number one, it was because there was a multiplication. The church was growing. They were getting a large number. I, I, I'd, be, I'd be very hard pressed to put a deacon on the church unless the church was growing and adding people. Right. You say, well, you can't have a church without deacons. They were doing fine here in Jerusalem for quite a while without any deacons. There's no rule of order that a church, I have an answer that we can, we're, you're, this is just not, we don't have any deacons, and I've got to put some deacons on it. I said, why? Well, you just don't have a church unless you have a pastor and deacon. I said, says who? When does that enter into the uh, identification of a church? But you have to have the right kind of officers. The before you can ever have a, have a deacon, you need to know why you have a deacon. I believe in the law of first mention. The first place you find it is usually the basic principles of what you find sin, where you find it, the garden. And that's where you go back and you have to find it. And I think it's a good rule of Bible interpretation. Where you find it first, you're going to find most of what you need to know about it. Here we find it. The first thing he says, there is multiplication. You don't put a man on deacon because you want to keep his tithe in the church. You don't put a man on deacon because you want to honor his great intelligence and great spirituality. That's not a deacon. Office deacon is not an honorary position given just to engrandize somebody or keep in the church. Amen. Amen. It's not there. Multiplication. That would be one. The church is growing. We need extra help. Then notice he says that the second reason in verse 1 is because there was murmuring. Isn't it odd that most of the murmuring started in our fundamental churches is started by deacons and deacon wives? Yep. But the first deacons were brought on to stop murmuring. The first deacons are here to stop murmuring. Yes. He said because there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. It was a murmuring on the basis of class, favoritism, racial. All that was, if you study this out, you find out that these are different racial people, different classes of people. And I'm going to tell you right now, 95% of the murmuring starts in the church because someone either feels better or feels slighted somehow or other in the church. And there's this murmur. That, and I always find it interesting when I look at this, why is it that it seems like the murmuring in most churches begins, and I, again, I think when God cast the devil out of heaven, he fell in one of two places. He fell either in the nursery or in, he fell in the choir hall, one of the two. <laughs> and that's where you have the most, the highest number of women in those two places. These are women. You notice the difficulties over how the women are being treated. Is that my misfit or did I just say the murmuring of the Grecian against the Hebrew because of their widows? And I think widows basically are women. It would be widower if there was men involved, right? Right. So it's a woman problem again. You say, well, preacher, you're hard on them. No, I'm not. It's not any harder than I'm on men. But when they show up and you see what's happening, murmuring. Who does he, what does he do? I want you to set some men aside and put this thing down. Stop it. Not ag aggravated, oh, and there's, there's qualifications in, in Timothy for, for a deacon's wife. Isn't it interesting? There's no qualifications for the pastor's wife. Amen. It's right. qualifications for the deacon's wife. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to read it. I read it talked so many times. He said, well, in that case, you know what she can do? She can have a pastor's wife. She can, be a, she can be a busybody. She can be a lousy housekeeper, not take care of her kids, and still be a pastor's wife. No, no, no. It's understood. You wouldn't have qualifications for the deacon. Same way, there, if you notice that the deacons and the pastors have almost identical uh, identical qualifications in, in 1st and 3, but there's some things required for the deacon that are not required for the pastor. I always thought that was interesting. Does that mean the pastor in those areas can, uh, he can be, well, one, I think one of the areas the deacon has to be careful of his tongue, but it doesn't say so the pastor. That means the pastor can be a busybody, but the deacon can't. Do you really believe that? You know, that's not what means. It's <laughs> understood, but I'm trying to get you to see is, the whole purpose was to put down murmuring. God help a deacon or a pastor's wife or anyone else's wife to involve in murmuring. And you don't put a man, you do not put a man in the office of deacon if his wife can't keep her mouth off the telephone. Amen. Amen. Good preacher, but that's what they Amen. I like that. I'll amen myself. I can't get help. <laughs> murmuring. There's problems in the church, and thus they need deacons. The third thing he tells them is because of the ministry. 
administration. He said uh, the daily administration. This is this is uh, the act of ministry, and uh, they're taking care uh, of, of the benevolence. Taking care of it says there in verse two, the twelve all the multitude together and said, "It is by reason that we should leave the word of God to do what serve tables." So they were they were selected to minister. Not to minister the word of God. It's very clear. They're going to minister the word of God. These men are going to serve tables. That area of deacon is not an area of the ministry of the word of God. Now, many of the deacons selected were preachers. And says Stephen was. And some of these others had the word. That doesn't mean it can't be. But did you notice why they were selected? To minister. What kind of ministry? Not the pulpit ministry. Not handling the word of God. He said, we'll give ourselves to what? Continually to what? The prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. It's very evident that God draws a line in this verse that the men of God, their priority ministry is prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. Preaching. Those two areas. It's very evident from this that the deacon's area is an area of serving tables and taking the burden off the preacher so that he can handle these other affairs. Now, nowhere is it indicated that these men were selected to be the ruling body of the church. Nowhere is it indicated they were selected to run the preacher. Somehow or another be his overseer or somehow the watchdog. I was in this meeting one time, one fellow said, Well, God's given me the ministry of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of looking out for the opposition, the other side. I'm here to present the other side of the question. And I told him in that meeting, there is no other side. There's God's side and your side. That's all there is to it. See, that was his idea. Someone had taught him. That as a deacon, as leading the church, it's his place to always come up with the negative side, uh, what the different view, the opposing view. Are you following what I'm saying? That's not indicated here at all. Here, here are these men, and he said to keep us from getting into this table business and get involved with these women, and all of this, all this day-to-day -day administration. I, I don't want that to be effect upon the word of God and their ministry. You look you out, seven men, and give you qualifications. So it's to minister. If you're not there as a figure, you have to come in and put your name on the checks every Sunday and then not do anything else the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. That's not deep. No. If you walk in here and have a deacon's pen and everybody knows you're deacon, you'd be out there seeing those people. You're out there to visit. You're out there to take care of the benevolence. See to the folks have food. And see to keep that off the preacher's back. Come to him. Here's the problem. That's, that's the position of deacon. It's a servant. Good preaching. Amen. Amen. It's multiplication, you said, murmuring and administration. Taking care of these uh, benevolence, these other things. Verse two, it says, it's for it's for the ministry. Look at verse two and in verse four. It said that we may get. It said verse two. It said it is not reason that we should leave the word of God. Look at verse four. But we will give ourselves. That's the that's the heads of the church. That's the men we call today as pastors. To give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the purpose of it is ministry in the sense that not you to do the ministry as a deacon, but to relieve. And I'm going to tell you right now, and you need to understand this very clearly, even in the early church, and Paul admonished this, that's why he said in Timothy that uh, you're not to muzzle the ox. Remember he quotes the Old Testament, how when an ox would tread out the corn? He said the same way with a minister, a preacher. You don't muzzle him. He eats of that ministry. He ministers to you in spiritual. You minister to him in carnal or physical. And the, the saddest thing in the world is to see a church where the, where the preacher either has to work or, and sometimes they have to, I worked for, for many years, and I, I'm not saying that isn't, isn't, but that's not the ultimate goal. The idea that having a preacher so bogged down with day-to-day -day physical needs he cannot provide the spiritual needs. Uh, you know, the pastor becomes the chief number one administrator, he becomes the number one contractor, he becomes the number one chief cook and bottle washer. He's the number one builder. He's the number one carpenter. He's the number one plumber. And I'll tell you, the church is going to go absolutely nowhere with that mentality. Can't operate that way. He must, how often? Continually pray. Continually in the Word of God. The paramount number one ministry is that prayer ministry and that preaching ministry. Because when people come in, they don't need to see the cows on his hands from ripping up the, the, the lumber for the building project this week. They need to see that his heart is in tune with God, full of the Word of God, because that's what was needed. Other men are to take care of the women, to take care of those other people. That doesn't mean he doesn't do his fair share and help and be like, you know, that's not, not it at all. And I would want a lazy preacher. Amen? If you want somebody like that, nobody wants that. But some folks got the idea of a preacher to spend two or three hours praying and reading his Bible and he's lazy. You want to try it sometime. And when someone says,
says that to you, you ought to ask them. They say, well, you know, he just lays up there and reads his books and prays. You ought to ask them, have you done that lately? When's the last time you locked yourself in prayer closet for three hours and prayed for five, ten, fifteen families? One thing to be a man responsible for one family. It's another thing a man who's responsible for his own family then carries the burdens and the hearts of five, ten, fifteen. In my case, when I pastored as many as thirty-five and forty families, it's different. You understand what I'm saying? So it's the idea of the ministry. And right from the beginning, that ministry for the, for the man of God was, was the Word of God and prayer. And uh, they, 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 and if you notice the results of what happens, or, well, he says they must be full of the Holy Ghost. And he says, I'm just looking at the qualifications. He says, honest, report, full of the Holy Ghost. He expands on that later. But I'm telling you right now, a man is not made as deacon and the treasurer of the church because he knows how to handle finances. That is a bad way to choose. We are not, but this is not a business. This is right. not, we do not have profit and loss columns in church work. It just, we have nothing to sell. How would you, how would you, how would you say, well, you, you know, keep books and you should keep track of where your money goes. I'm not saying that it would be foolish for us not to be able to have a financial report, give a business meeting accountability. Remember what I said? Accountability and responsibility. I know a lot of preachers, they, have, they don't want to be accountable. They just sign the checks, spend the money, and if anybody doesn't like it, they, they damn the person to hell for questioning the preacher. That's ridiculous. You ought to be able to account for it. But we do not sit down and say, is this a profitable move financially? Hey, Amen. In fact, go out here and try to get money laid up in CDs and try to hold money. That's not how the business of God works. So how does it work? The Bible is very clear. We operate, um, some, well, they didn't think Barnabas was very wise, did they? He sold everything he had, gave it to the church. And Ananias and Sapphira, they thought that was a pretty good idea. And what did they do? They practiced good business sense. They sold the property, kept back part, and told the people that they sold it for this much. That's good business practice. You, you don't give it all away. Why? We gave some to God. Come on. Our yeah. money now. This is the time to smile and say amen for our money. I mean, they did a good business and they sold us a good piece of land. They kept back some, maybe for their old age, maybe they kept, I don't know what reason they kept back. And they probably gave a goodly amount, probably as much as Barnabas gave, if not more. As far as amount was concerned, it probably was good. And they gave it openly. And, and uh, what did Peter say? He said, what has, he said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Remember our requirement here is to be full of the Holy Ghost. Why, wow, we would have made Ananias and Sapphira, we would have made them deacons. Why, they would have been song leaders. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I mean, they're giving them money. And Peter, the man of God, somehow or other, John always lets the man of God know that things aren't right. He said, what are you doing lying to the Lord? Did you not? He said, when it was your own, don't you know you had to? It was your own. And for and Acts 5. He said, don't you know what Peter's saying? Hey, God didn't ask you to give that money. Nobody demanded that of you. That was yours. You could have done with it what you wanted to. But you come in here and you practice this thing. And God struck a graveyard dead right there. Four or five hours later, his wife comes to church. She gets struck dead. The wife always comes late. Hello? Yeah. Did you miss that? She come in out how many hours late? Maybe a little while. Maybe her hair was up and she couldn't get down. I don't know what it is. I mean, they had church. Church had been still going on three, four, five hours later. Here comes Anna Nice. She doesn't know her husband's dead. And uh, she comes in and says, is this, is this what your husband told us about this money? She says, oh, yeah, she had it. We, we gave you that money. She dropped dead. God killed her. What, what are you trying to, what is the thing that you're trying to, I'm trying to tell you, the Holy Ghost and leadership is not based on, and we don't run the business of God by profit and loss charts, financial records, that's not how we do it. We do what God tells us to do at the time. Yeah. The Bible let God give everything he had. So it was not that everybody else was supposed to do that, that's what God told the right. to do. They tried to copy that and practice business sense in it, God is dead. You know what happens to a church that gets to doing that? you got some guy here checking off how much money was spent for toilet paper. And how much, oh, Pastor went up to Oregon, or up to uh, Portland the other day. He spent $38. I can drive to Oregon, so it took $22. Now, why did, he, why did it cost him $38 when I can go to Portland on 22 I've seen that happen in church. That's right. And that's junk. It's foolish. You mean, tell me, he took the preacher out, and they spent $50 on a meal? Now, come on. I can take the preacher out. We go down here to the hot dog heaven, and I can get him for $12. Come on. That's right. That's how sometimes we operate. We might have all this money here. Miscellaneous. $12,000 for a year for miscellaneous. You know. Yeah. I always practice in my church. We always have, when I pass an open book, you come to me and what do you put in miscellaneous? I don't know where else to put it, so I put it in miscellaneous. If you want to come look at the checkbook, you're welcome to see it. I, 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 and I made my point. I don't want to labor on it, but I just want you to see that these men.
men were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And it's the Holy Ghost first and then wisdom. It's wisdom of God, but the Holy Spirit. And he says that we should appoint over this business. Notice how these deacons are selected. They first, first they're selected by the people and appointed by the preachers. Now, we had this big deal about voting in deacons and electing. I don't have anything wrong with that, but that deacon that's, a, that's elected had better first be appointed by the pastor. Appointed people can be unappointed. If you know how our government operates, an appointee is someone who's in fire. An electee is someone you have to get unelected, so they have to resign. So apparently, these men were appointed over that business. In other words, they selected the men out. I'm just, I'm just, they selected the men. And of those men, the pastors appointed some men to that business. The business was going on. When the business was over, the job was over. Or uh, they were there at the prerogative of the pastor. You say, why does it have to be that way? You can't have a two-headed animal. Anything that's two-headed is a monster. There's only one. God didn't use a committee to lead the children of Israel out of the wilderness. God gave them a man. Amen. It's always been that way. So what if the man's not right? God will take care of that business. That's not my message this morning. I'm just trying to emphasize to you God's order. A good church has a biblical order and biblical offices. And they're appointed, they're selected, and they're presented. What was the result of all this? The Bible says it pleased the full multitude. They chose Stephen, and the Bible says they grew. Look at verse 7. And the word of God increased. Isn't that wonderful? To see the word of God increased. Why? Biblical order, biblical offices. The same thing happened to Thessalonica. Biblical order, biblical office. That doesn't mean, and I am not of the opinion, I do not follow uh, some of the, of the forms today. Uh, they, they literally, they literally uh, castrate demons. They make them a non-entity. I know preachers that talk about them as being demons. And they treat them like dogs. They talk about them like they haven't got good sense. God gives a church deacons, and they're godly men. Men like here, you ought to thank the Lord for a good guy. God has given me when I was a part of you, they had, had quite a few men that served the teachers were good, godly men. You ought to thank the Lord for them. They're a big help in the ministry. Don't ever get the idea that they're the enemy of the preacher, they're the, and uh, that the preachers are in. But when you, skip, when you don't use biblical principles, you get some eight ball in there, they all kinds of stuff. Right here in they can just hurt the church terrorists. Better not to have any than to have one you wish you didn't have. Right. And so, follow God's a good church. Has biblical order, biblical officers, biblical ordinances, has baptism, the Lord's Supper. I just say that because some churches are dealing with baptism. A lot of the King James crowd have gotten into hyper dispensations to the point that they don't even baptize their converts. That is, that's not good. There is baptism. Are you hearing me? Baptism and the Lord's Supper in that order. There's biblical offerings, that's tithes and offerings, free will. One of the things that need to be really emphasized you don't coerce money out of God's people. Uh, you have to give willingly. If people do not give willingly, there's something wrong spiritually in the church. One of the emphasis of a, of a, of a heart that's spiritual, of a group of people who love God, is that they're giving. Free will giving. You know, you go over there in the offerings, and Leviticus, the first chapter, you say, let every man voluntarily give. Voluntarily give. Uh, I think you're bastard on God, not right with God, not a tithe. Yeah, how can you even be call yourself a child of God and not honor God with a tent. I mean, that's all a tent is, is simply a recognition of God's lordship and authority. You do, not, you do not give a tent. Am I explaining this to you? You don't give a tent. A tent belongs to God. It's already, how can you give somebody something that belongs to him? I know it all belongs to him, but he makes a demand of a tent. It's just a gauge. It's just a means by which we recognize his authority. My soul, you better be thankful he didn't ask for 90% left tent for you to live on. And a tent is a fair, or as we call it, a just way of giving. It's equal, tent. And uh, I'm just saying that's God's method. You say, well, preacher, I think it's legalistic. Well, you tell that to Abraham. He thought it was responsible to tithe. He did it 400 and some years before the law was ever given. So apparently it's a principle of basics. And then there's that free will. You don't start giving until you pass the tithe. Because the tithe is of the Lord, it belongs to him for him in the storehouse. Then you begin to give above that. And I'll tell you, no church, any church, will ever survive on the tithe. You can't live on the tithe. Churches go broke on the tithe. If all we're doing is tithe, we're in trouble. It takes the love offerings, the almgiving of God's people, free will offerings above that to help the work, to help the man of God, to help the mission, to do all that you need to do. Then, of course, there's not only the offerings, but again, of course, there's faith missions. All of that's involved. And uh, you have, I mean, a good church will have biblical offerings, order, ordinances, uh, biblical law. We'll have biblical obedience. Man, man, go through the Bible. You find in Romans 2, talk about obeying the truth. He 
says it in Galatians 3 1. Obey the truth. Obey the truth. Obey parents. Ephesians 6 1. How can a church with children to obey the parents? How, how, how in the Lord's name are you ever going to be able to show a community out here that's lost its moorings on family values, family truths, if our families aren't following the biblical principles where children obey the parents? I mean, it's part of it. Uh, Obey our masters, it says in Colossians 3. Obey the gospel. Obey the word, 2 Thessalonians 3.14. Obey magistrates. Obey him, Hebrews 5.9. We're told to obey. And I know that is a dirty word. How do you spell O-B-E-Y? Dirty four-letter word. Another dirty word in Baptist circle. Real dirty four-letter word. That's W-O-R-K. Work. Mm -hmm. We just don't like it. We're yeah. grace, grace, grace. All by like man. But I'm telling you, these are things that mark a good church. People work and they're obedient. That doesn't mean we're in lockstep like a bunch of cults, idiots, we can't think for ourselves. We obey the scriptures, we obey the truth. It doesn't matter who preaches it. The truth is the truth. And our response is that of obedience. Is that not correct? Amen. So you have, now, that's some of the principles. Now, why do some people have a good church? I mean, what is the purpose of it? Well, some have a good church because they want somebody to evangelize and entertain the children. They want a good church. I've had phone calls these last 20 years. What do you have for my children? What do you have for young people over there? I have two or three calls a week. Well, I were thinking about making a change. I lived in a metropolitan area for 14 years, pastor there, four and a half million people. I could lose half my church for two or three weeks, get them all back. They didn't even know who they were. I mean, there's people, I mean, there's people moving in. You got a, a pool to draw from four million people. Amen. You take about a million and a half uh, inner city people out of that, and that still leaves you 300 or three million people to work with. So you know, you lose a family here, and there you go out knocking some doors and get back. You take what's what's the penalty? Fifty thousand? Fifteen thousand? Okay, you know, it wouldn't take long to get every door in this place. And then you have to check the water hookup and the gas hookup and the phone hookup to find out the new people moving in. And then 15 churches jump up every time they move in. Is that not correct? I mean, it's, it's not the pool is this big. And what I'm saying is, you know why folks want a church? They want you, as a church, to entertain their children and to evangelize them. Let me tell you something, Mom and Dad. God gave you the job of entertaining and evangelizing your children. That's not the church's job. Yeah. That's not why you have a good church. Now, it's nice to have young people and do what you can and have fun, but that's not the job of the church. We, you know what some guys want to do? They want to work 50 hours a week. Mama wants to work 40 hours a week. Set in front of the VCR and send the kids off down to the youth group. Well, let the church went to God. Let the church advance. Let the church that's your job. We send them Christian school the same way. Right. It's our place to do that. So that's someone a good church to have a contact. They want to sell Tupperware, Shackley, Amway, Avon, home <laughs> yeah. desecrators, car sales, insurance sales, and uh, I don't know what all else. Job prospects. <laughs> right. I don't forget I come to the back door to park you. Some has been many, many years ago. And as I come in the back of the house, I look at the back two pews were loaded with plastic bags. One plastic bag was filled with Tupperware. I mean, just had all kinds of Tupperware. They had a Tupperware party. The ladies got together. That's, I don't have a problem with that. But the delivery point was the church. You know, you order it, they bring it. So this Tupperware lady, remember after she got the back pew with her, the next pew had, plat had these bags from Avon. She was an Avon distributor, and she made her contact to the church, and here was her Avon stuff all stacked up. Then there was this lady that was in home desecrators, and she had all these home design stuff. And I thought to myself, my God, we're running the, we're running the AMP store back here in the back of the church. I got up that night and I said, and we had a Shackley dealer. She sold, you know, you couldn't be healthy without taking 15,000 pills of Shackley. I mean, the seaweed pills and calcium pills. I don't know. You ever seen these Shackley people? They take a plastic bag that's full of pills. Man, if you just eat food, you do a <laughs> I mean, just load up on Shackley and buy these, and then make their deliveries in the church. I got up that night and I said, this is it. I don't ever see another Shackley jar. I don't see any more Amway. I don't see any more. None of it. You make your contacts outside this building. You do not use this church as an opportunity to make money. Good principle. Amen. Hey, That's the answer. said, did they quit doing it? No. If my wife, I, there's a rule my wife made, I made for her, that she goes to no Tupperware parties, Shackley parties, Amway parties. She doesn't attend any of those. Doesn't she like that stuff? No. But this is what happens. She attends one and doesn't attend the other because she has to go with me to a meeting or she's not there. Here we go again. We've got the idea that she <laughs> likes Shackley better than she likes Amway. She didn't come to my party and she likes her better than she likes me. And she didn't come. Amen. That's right. She doesn't go to baby showers. 
She goes to baby showers. Only the baby showers given at church. She goes, wants to give it home. She just told her. She said, give. She goes, give. Why would you do that? She just told you why. Mm-hmm. Okay, what I'm saying is church is not a place for you to make business and social contests. It's to have someone, they need to have a place. Some folks go to church. You know why they go to church? They need to have a wedding. Yeah, that's right. They've got kids who got to get married, so they go to church, a good church. So they have a place to get the kids married. And a preacher, you do it for twenty dollars. Or if you go down the road, they have the other guy who's going to cost them hundred bucks. Plus, the church has a fellowship hall, and they're a church member, and they get it for nothing. Mm-hmm. But if you have to go to church and, and rent one and all that other, come on now. Yeah, like you know, got to have a good church because you got wedding, you got showers. I'm going to have babies, and man, if I don't have a church, who's going to put on a shower for me? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, sometimes it's bridal showers and baby showers. Something you've got to die, you need to have a funeral. My soul, we just get any old guy that proves the funeral. It's got to cost us a hundred bucks. We get the old pastor. You know, he's our pastor, then our pastor. And uh, why we get him to give us a funeral for, for nothing. You know, he'll say, well, do we owe you anything, preacher? And they'll say, well, no, you don't owe me nothing. Well, that's good. Thank you, preacher. You're our pastor. And he don't get the business one. Some guy comes from the outside, they give him a hundred bucks. Good preaching, brother. Has right. <laughs> we want a church for a wedding. We want a church for showers. We want a church for funerals. And if I go to the hospital, my soul, nobody will visit me if I don't have a church. So I join a church, get in church. And then you know what I do? What they do? They get sick. They go to the hospital. They don't tell nobody. They don't tell the pastor. They don't tell the pastor's wife. They lay up there for three days on the phone saying, you know what? The pastor had not been seen me. Right. I've been up for two days. And he didn't even know he was in the hospital. Yeah. I went up, I went up one lady. I'm thinking of specifically. I went to the hospital. And I walked in, I heard my wife told me. I called in, I think. I was at the hospital, I was at the hospital, Providence Hospital. And one of the girls had a baby and I was up there. And uh, I was heading out and I always called from the hospital. I said, Karen, you know, she said, yeah, this is so and so. She's at Providence. I said, she is. I didn't know she was talking. She said, well, here's a rumor. So I went up to see her. I went all back up, went in the room. She said, well, this is what she said. This is what she said. She was about time. I said, but what do you mean about time? <laughs> She said, well, I've been up here for three days. You had not come. And I had lost it. Oh, I had all the black hand. I had it right up to you. I said, look, lady, now, am I supposed to read minds? Am I supposed to be telepathy? Did you call the church? Did you let your family let us know? Did you call my wife? Did you know my wife had to find it out from another woman? Don't give me that. I've been here. How can I come if I don't know? Amen. And I didn't pray with her. You say, why did you pray? I couldn't. In the state of mind I was in. I turned around and walked off on the next agency. I was hot. He said, Oh, you can't be spiritual. Oh, yeah. About two thirds of, of good preaching is done when you're about halfway there. Right. But I'm telling you, people have this idea they want somebody to visit them, they want somebody to care about their family, they want, the, they want, they want a church to be involved in, and all hell breaks loose in the home, and they're having difficulty. Then they, then they don't even want to preach them. And then they say, Well, you should have known. Why weren't you here? Well, it's good. <laughs> sometimes it's to have contact. Sometimes it's just to have a place with it. Sometimes they need it for a home. The kid goes off to school, he likes care packages. So you have a church, so they can send it to Bob Jones, BBF, whatever school. And the kid gets care packages all the time in college. They get love books from the church. And then they come home, and, and, the, school, and the church is a dumb church. The school knows more than the pastor knows, and you lose it. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, home. Someone to, you know, like I said, care packages, cards, money. Uh, then someone to blame. You know why I have a good church? When you backslide, you got to have somebody to blame. Yeah. You have a good church, when you backslide, you go cold, your marriage breaks up, your children go bad. You've got to have a good church so you can blame the pastor. He's too busy, he's too hard, he's uncaring. That's why I'm out of church. See, you didn't have a church, you couldn't blame him. You get, get my point? If you have a good church and then you do wrong, you always got the church blame. Or you blame the people. They're too cold. They're unfriendly. They're critical. My folks, you got to have your good churches because you got to have somebody to blame. It's never your fault. Surely, you didn't do anything wrong. Amen. You ought to be taught, hey, well, I, I told you, I may look like I just walked in yesterday, but I've been around a while. 21 years past, listen to me. You go to someone's house and visit, they're, they're a dissident, they're unhappy with it. You've got a good church. People care, they pray, they're trying to do the best they can, the pastor's doing and they, and they start in. It's never, never, ever anything they've done. It's always somebody else. Always somebody else. If you believe that, i got some land that's underwater on the floor and I'd like to sell it. i got some land. Don't believe that kind of mess. That's one reason people like a good church. You always blame them for the short run. Well, my time is up. Can I just say a couple more things? Not close. Let me give you. Why, why do we need? Why do we? What, what's, what's the real need? First of all, because of our tendency to be discouraged. 
you by nature, human nature is to be discouraged. Don't ever believe this business about you're always up and always happy. We by human nature. The majority of people will go, it's not a half full bottle, it is a half empty bottle. It is not a partly sunny day, it's always what? A partly cloudy day. That's just our nature. You know why you need, you know why you need this church, a good church? Because you come in here 99 or 9 percent of the time, you go out of here and encourage. You're glad you come, even when you come sick. You need it. We have a tendency to get down. We have a tendency. David got discouraged. Moses got discouraged. Peter got discouraged. Job was discouraged. Paul himself talked about this present distress. And what helped them? It's a good church. That's why you need one. You need yeah. the right church for your disturbance. Then you have a you have a you have a temptation to be disobedient. We have a bent. I, some of you are saved, but you're not totally sanctified yet. <laughs> and we have we, we are prone to disobey. You know what you need a good church for? You need somebody to grab you by the neck and neck and shake you and say, hey, you're not going the right way. You, you need to have a voice. You need someone to let you know. Because we have a tendency to go against God. And that's what a good church is all about. And I don't know how many times I've had people tell me over these years, you know, preacher, boy, you helped me this morning. I brought my mind and set in that direction, and you, and you, you brought some light here. I can see. Have you, anybody here ever gone to church and not say, you know, I didn't know that was wrong, but I, and that helped me see that I'm going in the right direction. And uh, you need that. And a good church. And then because of our, our testimony to declare, again, a good church is what he said of the Thessalonican church was when you sounded out the gospel. And, I'm, and I don't mean to be overly simplistic, but you, it is hard. You cannot win people to God and then have a church that, that just allows anything and everything to go on. And, and the people, you go out and visit as a pastor. What a joy it was for me at Parkview when I went out and knocked on the door. And I said, you know, they said, well, you can't live like that. I said, I'm going to show you ten families to live like that. Amen. I come to church, I'll tell you, ten young couples with children, the same mess you're in, and then they're, they're doing good. Hey, you're a widower, so I can't live. i got five widowers in the church to live just like I'm teaching. It can be done. Mm -hmm. See, the testimony that you, that you preach is backed up by the lives of this church. And you say, well, what does it matter if I live right? What does it matter if I'm clean? What does it matter if I don't do it? matters because that man right there has to have that in order to preach to these people in his family. And as this family here goes out and knocks on doors, as this lady witnesses to her friends and witnesses to people who have heard her husband know, as she talks to them, she must be able to say to them, oh, come to church. We can show you people that are like you that, are, that have the victory that I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? And if this church is full of a bunch of folks who want to live with God and be right and just mess around, what good is your testimony? Mm -hmm. Amen? What good is your testimony? Why well, have a good church? I hope the Thessalonian like church is a help to you and, and some of these things might encourage you that it's not, it's not all heaviness to do right. There's some real reasons behind it, some real joy behind it, and some real fruitfulness in being with God that has us to be. God help us as we go into the morning hour. Bless these few words of this little bit out of Thessalonians to this, this people. And Lord, uh, as the days go by, I pray that uh, some of the uh, seeds that have been planted this morning would bring fruit. Some of what Brother Bray has preached would be watered this morning and be encouraged and strengthened. God, give us a witness here. I pray that it would be one that is pleasing to you and has your approval before we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.